Okay, so here we are. Um, and we've been talking about Old English literature. And in our last class, we spent a good deal of time uh, not only talking about the culture, but also, in particular, uh, we have been talking about Cadman's hymn, which is the first surviving poem in Old English that we have. And uh, by the way, since I mentioned Old English, let me just say that linguists who are interested in the historical development of the English language designate the language spoken by the Anglo-Saxons as Old English. That's from the beginnings up until, oh, a little bit after the Norman Conquest. And then starting a little bit after the Norman Conquest, there is a major shift. We'll talk about this a little bit later on. There's a major shift in the English language. And so it is designated by linguists as Middle English. And Middle English is, for example, the language used by Chaucer, as we shall see a little bit later on. And Middle English continues until roughly the beginning of the 16th century. I mean, obviously, these dates are not absolutely precise, so the change in the language would not all take place on January 1st, 1500, but uh, roughly around that time. And so then we begin the development of early modern English, which, of course, is the precursor of our kind of modern English. And that's the language that you find in, say, Shakespeare in the King James Bible which is a little different from our version of English today, but not so different that you have to have translators for you, right? Whereas with Old English, you actually really do have to study it as a foreign language. And it becomes a specialized study in itself. As a matter of fact, our graduate students, as is true of graduate students in most graduate English programs, can count Old English if they want to as a foreign language, as fulfilling a foreign language requirement. So uh, that's how different it is from modern English. And you probably noticed that when I was drawing your attention to Cadman's hymn last time, and I was reading it aloud, that not only does it look very different from modern English on the page, but it also sounds very different, right? It's a Germanic language. But we'll be talking about the changes that the English language underwent after the Anglo-Saxon period in another couple of classes. So having said all of that, uh, remember we looked not only at Cadman's hymn and the, uh, the, the legend surrounding that is recounted by Bede, often called the Venerable Bede the greatest of the early historians of England, and one of the great historians of all time. But then we looked at the dream of the rude and the wanderer as examples of other kinds of Old English poetry. And I'd like to draw your attention particularly to the wanderer once again as a poem in which we see the kind of cultural tensions that I've been talking about in the course for the last couple of hours at least, uh, in which you have the culture of the North now coming into contact with the Mediterranean culture from the South, born particularly, not, not simply by merchants, but particularly by the Christian missionaries who are coming up from the Mediterranean South. And we've talked to a certain extent about the kinds of, of tensions that existed there. And once again, let me say something that I was saying at the very end of our discussion of The Wanderer, because this is a point that's going to carry over into the discussion of Beowulf, which we're going to begin in just a few minutes. And that is that if you took off the very beginning and the very end of the poem, where you have the voice of the poet speaking, and you simply had the voice of the wanderer, which is the majority of the poem, right? That poem of the wanderer himself, 
really doesn't sound particularly Christian at all, does it? And that could very easily have come from somebody who was not a Christian. What's he doing? He's simply lamenting the fact that he is now alone, friendless, without family, without any kind of support, and most particularly without a leader. A leader who would not only give gifts to him and take care of him in certain ways, but also who would provide leadership and cohesion to a community. So all alone, he is now forced to be a wanderer. And he reflects on how uh, you know, everything has passed away. And notice that I mentioned Ubi Sunt last time, the Ubi Sunt motif in, uh, in that poem. And I said that this was a very common motif in late classical and in medieval poetry. That is spelled, by the way, And it's usually referred to as the ubi sunt motif. Okay. So, and we'll be meeting that again because that's going to come up again and again in uh, in the literature. So he is lamenting the fact that, oh my God, you know, uh, where is the hall? Where are the hall joys? What has happened to the music? Where are the great uh, steeds that we used to have? What about all of the friends, the, the joy that we used to have together, and so forth? All these things have passed away. And all he can do is simply try to reach within himself and find the courage to accept his fate, with an emphasis on the word weird or fate, right? Now, what does that have to do with Christianity? Notice, however, that a Christian can come along and pick up those very sentiments and then turn them to the advantage of a Christian missionary who is trying to convert the people of the North saying, aha, you're absolutely right. You can't count on the things of this world. And that's precisely why you have to turn your attention to the realities of the next world. And that becomes one of the devices, obviously, for encouraging people to convert to Christianity. And having converted to Christianity to stay with Christianity. Because remember, one of the things I talked about before is that there were people who would lapse from time to time. And sometimes whole parts of England, you know, the people would have converted to Christianity and then they'd decide, well, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good thing after all. And they would go back to the old religion for a while. And then maybe a generation or two later, they would reconvert to Christianity with a whole new group of people. So uh, we're going to see those kinds of interesting tensions developing in Beowulf as well. Beowulf is a poem which goes back to very ancient times. There's actually one historical person in the poem for whose existence we have independent corroboration. And that is uh, Beowulf's lord or king and uncle named Heolach. Heolach. Remember Heolach? OK, let's see now if I can manage doing this properly. There we are. OK, and now I'm back to this. OK, his name is. And that's pronounced Heolach. The, uh, the G is not like our soft G, our J G. It's more like our Y sound. And Heolach actually was engaged in a raid in the Low Countries, what are now the Low Countries, back in the, uh, in the 6th century. And he was killed there. That is retained in Beowulf, because we have a number of references in Beowulf to the fact that he was killed during that raid. Uh, 
And that raises, by the way, some interesting questions on its own, which we'll get into later on. But for the moment, let me simply say that there are chronicles dating from that time, which clearly indicate who he was, what he was doing there, and how he was killed. So he's an actual historical figure. So we know that at least that one element of the poem goes back not simply to an historical person, a real historical person, but it actually goes back at least a couple of hundred years before Beowulf was composed. Now we don't know exactly when Beowulf was composed in the form in which it has come down to us, but it appears to have been based upon much earlier oral tradition in much the same way that Homer's epics are or were. You know, we can actually find in the case of, of Homer, we can find uh, examples of some of the stories that Homer was drawing on in earlier accounts, that is to say, that predate Homer's time. And so here is Homer drawing together a lot of traditional narrative and poetic material and putting it together in the Iliad and in the Odyssey. So also with the Beowulf poet. The Beowulf poet is drawing upon more ancient oral traditions, both poetic and narrative, and putting these things together in the poem as we have it now. Now, when was it composed? We don't know exactly. Uh, scholars used to say that it was composed probably in the first half of the 8th century. In other words, sometime between 700 and 750. And the argument went like this, that there are enough Christian references in Beowulf that for a popular poem like this to have incorporated this much of Christian thinking and believing and practicing into the poem, Christianity had to have been around for a while. You know, I mean, you couldn't just have a superficial conversion to Christianity uh, and then produce a poem like this. So uh, since the, the first missionaries were coming from the south anyway, at the tail end of the 500s, 597 to be specific, uh, what most scholars thought was it would take about 100 years for Christianity to become that deeply embedded into the culture for it to be so easily referred to in a popular poem such as this. Because you're not simply talking about a poet, you're also talking about audience. I mean, if somebody is writing a poem or composing a poem uh, in which the references don't mean anything to the people who are the audience of the poem, what's the point? So, uh, how do you establish the other end of the dating? If you say, for example, that it had to have been written uh, probably after about 700, well, how do you establish the other end of the dating problem? Well, most scholars would say, or have said in the past, by the end of the 8th century, that is to say by the end of the 700s, the Viking invasions had already started. Now one of the things you will notice is, who is this poem about? Anybody? Any? Who is this poem about? What peoples are the subject of this poem? Yeah, pre press your button. The Yeats. Yeah, okay. And who else? Danes, right? Okay. Don't forget to press your buttons when you, when you say something. You know, the button on that little device on your table there. Uh, and that's the way that, uh, that other students will be able to hear you when they are uh, viewing these on, on tape or video on, or DVD. Okay, so they're Scandinavians, right? The Geats, or Yeatas in Old English, uh, were Scandinavians. They're probably from uh, what is now southern Sweden. We can't be absolutely precise about that, but that seems to be pretty close to accurate. And then, of course, 
The Danes are the Danes. We know where Denmark is today, right? Well, it's the same Denmark. And uh, then we have references to lots of other Scandinavian peoples, tribal groupings. So we have in England the earliest epic poem, heroic epic poem in the English language is about Scandinavians. Well, the earlier scholars used to think, well, then because the Danes start harassing the English and even raiding and then invading into England, you know, uh, at the end of the 700s and in the early part of the 800s, well, you know, you're not going to have a heroic poem celebrating Scandinavians, not in English at that time. So they'd say, well, roughly then the first half of the 8th century, or roughly 700 to 750. It is now believed by an increasing number of scholars, including myself, that the date is probably a good deal later than that, that there were times later on, as I mentioned when I was giving you my brief historical sketch of early England, there were times in which there were long periods or relatively long periods of peace between the English and the Scandinavians who had now settled in England. And there was a lot of intermarrying going on. So in the northeast of England in particular, there was really a kind of Anglo-Scandinavian culture. And that would have been in the 10th century or even possibly in the early 11th century. And that makes a whole lot more sense in terms of fitting the facts as we know them a lot better than the earlier date. Now, why should that make any difference? Why should we really care uh, except you know, for a handful of specialized scholars when the poem was created? Well, it does make a difference in terms of how we interpret the poem in all sorts of ways not the least of which is to answer the question, how could you have a poem in English which celebrates Scandinavians and makes all kinds of easy, casual references to Scandinavian peoples, uh, their kings and queens, their battles, their struggles with one another, and so forth, which obviously would not have made sense to just any English audience but would presumably make sense to an audience in English that had at least some Scandinavian ancestry or background. So once we begin to think about that, we can also think about, well, you know, what kind of culture did the Scandinavians have and how did that relate to the culture of the English at the time, and so on and so on and so on. Well, I'm not going to take this point too far, but uh, you can see that there are lots of interesting problems that come up in the study of Beowulf. But for us, we're going to be looking primarily at Beowulf as a literary narrative. However it was originally produced, and whenever it was originally produced, the work is one of our great early literary creations in the English language. So, uh, having said that, let's go to the PowerPoint, please. You will notice that the poem is constructed around a whole series of thematic tensions, of thematic tensions. And what I'm about to say about these thematic tensions is largely based on the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. Sound familiar? Who's, who's J.R.R. Tolkien? Who's, who's Tolkien? He wrote all the Lord of the Rings. Okay, the Lord of the Rings. Okay. Um, everybody knows that now, right? Well, actually, when Tolkien wrote that, a lot of people didn't know about uh, Tolkien, of course, but he was a professor of Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse studies a university professor in England. This was his specialty, Beowulf 
and the Old Norse or Old Icelandic sagas. Why do you suppose the Lord of the Rings has all of that kind of stuff in it? You know, uh, it reads something like Beowulf and the Icelandic sagas. Well, there's a good reason for that. And he was one of the, most, the foremost professors and scholars of his whole generation, specializing in this area. Okay, so thematic tensions. First of all, we have a pagan view of life with so-called pagan rituals and codes of behavior to a very large extent. And we even have a kind of fatalism, as we were talking about a few minutes ago in the Wanderer, the central part of the Wanderer. Weird the mighty, weird conquers all, all that sort of thing. And then, of course, the emphasis on the comitatus. The comitatus, if we can go uh, now, Scott, and we go, yeah, back over here. What I'm going to do is very quickly erase that and go back to, let's see, oh, I have to do this first. Okay. Tacitus. was an historian. Any of you know Tacitus, or the work of Tacitus? He was a Roman historian who wrote a work called Germania, or if you prefer, Germania. Around the year 100. We don't know what contact he had with the Germanic tribes to the north of the Roman Empire. He may have had some personal contact, or it may be that he simply uh, interviewed visitors from the Germanic tribe down to Rome, or talked to Romans who had encountered the Germanic tribes to the north. But in any event, he wrote a whole work in which he talked about the Germanic peoples to the north. And one of the things he stresses is that the bond of loyalty which exists between the tribal chieftain or lord and his followers, he calls by the Latin word comitatus. The old English word, by the way, that's usually used in Beowulf and elsewhere, you don't have to remember this part, but is dricht. It's pronounced dricht. Uh, but the comitatus. Now the comitatus, which by the way gives us our word committee, I mean it doesn't really mean committee uh, in, in Latin, but it's the word that has come into the English language and evolved into our modern word committee. Uh, the comitatus is the group formed by the, the chief and the followers together. And that means that there are reciprocal relations of loyalty and of obligation between the chief and the followers. I'm using the term chief here because while you see in translations of Beowulf things like, uh, oh, the Lord and the King and so on and so on, you have to remember that at the time that we are talking about, somebody who is designated as a kinig or king was really a kind of tribal chieftain, okay? Because the king's kingdom in some cases would only involve a few hundred people, you know, in a relatively small territory. We didn't yet have nation states in the sense of our modern nation states. So in any, way, in any event, the chieftain in the comitatus has an obligation not only to provide leadership for the group, but also to give them of his property, of his wealth, and so forth. We talked about that last time, right? Wealth is valuable only to the extent to which it is shared. It is given away. That's why the chief or chieftain or king is often referred to as the gift giver, right? 
in The Wanderer and also here in Beowulf. Uh, Hrothgar is referred to again and again and again as the gift giver of the Danes and of course to the Danes. Now in response the leader can count on the loyalty of the followers. This is a reciprocal relationship, right? And that's what the comitatus is. And so the followers owe absolute loyalty, absolute loyalty even to the death to support the leader, the chieftain, the lord, the king. Okay, just to give you an idea, by the way, of scale, in Ireland at this time, there were more kingdoms than, and more kings and more kingdoms than in England. But in Ireland at this time, the usual estimates run that there were probably about 200 kings. At the same time, by the way. I'm not talking about in series, but at the same time. So the term king itself means back at the time that we're talking about now, something very different than it does to us in modern times. Okay, uh, so this is something, by the way, this comitatus relationship described by Tacitus is something that exists among the Germanic peoples before they are converted to Christianity. So this too is part of a very ancient, and if you want to use the word pagan, pagan cultural tradition among the Germanic peoples. By the way, uh, does anybody know where the word pagan originally came from? What are paganos in Latin? Any, any Latin scholars here? Um, paganos are country folk. The reason why pagans were called pagans uh, is that in the early development of Christianity, it was largely, if not primarily, an urban religion. It, uh, it moved from one city to another city to another city to another city to another city. And the earliest Christian converts uh, for generations were mainly people who lived in urban centers. And missionary activities were carried out mainly in urban centers in part because it's more difficult to deal with a rural population that may be spread out everywhere, right? In little farms here and there. So that the people who converted to Christianity last tended to be country folk. And so the word for country folk in Latin for the Romans was paganus. And so it became synonymous with people who were not Christians. Also, country people tended, I mean, whether one wants to say this is still true or not, uh, certainly in the past, have tended to be more conservative than urban peoples. Uh, and by that I mean to hold on to traditions longer than people in urban cultures where things move and evolve and change much faster. And this is particularly true in the past, where you could study rural cultures that would remain more or less unchanged for centuries, you know, unless some outside force were to intervene. Whereas urban cultures seldom remain stable in that way. So, in any event, um, this whole notion of the comitatus is really uh, something that comes out of a pre-Christian, or if you wish, pagan culture. So there are a lot of things here in Beowulf that are indicative of a kind of northern culture which until fairly recently had not been Christian or Christianized. Uh, there were other things, by the way. In battle, very interesting stuff, you know. Uh, Tacitus talks about what was the role of women in battle. Well, sometimes women actually had to fight alongside the men. I mean, if it were, if, if your farmstead is being attacked, I mean, everybody who can 
has to pick up a weapon and try to resist the, uh, the attackers, right? Uh, women as well as men. But uh, in terms of actual battles in which you would have, uh, you know, war bands, these war bands would consist of men and only of men, so far as we know, with a few exceptions, like I mentioned Boudicca earlier on, a, uh, uh, an early British queen who also became a war band leader to fight against the Romans in the early period of Roman occupation. Uh, but that's a relative rarity, at least as far as we know. And so what does Tacitus say? Well, where were the women while these battles were taking place among the men? According to Tacitus, the women would go out and they would stand on the sidelines where the, uh, where the men were, and they would, uh, they would strip down to the waist, and then they would describe in apparently great detail what the men were going to lose if they lost the battle, and what the other side was going to gain if they won the battle. Uh, that is to say, the enemies won the battle. Uh, and apparently, this um, was sufficient encouragement for the warriors that uh, it generally worked. Now, uh, we don't have independent confirmation outside of Tacitus for that, but in any event, that's one of the things that Tacitus talks about. And he has all kinds of other interesting things about the, these uh, cultures of the North. So, uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint, Scott. Okay, so, what I've been saying is that there are a number of things in Beowulf and in the culture of the poem Beowulf which really go back to a point before Christianity and which continued on into the Christian period. But at the same time, there's also a Christian view of history as history always being directed by divine providence. And this is an idea that was developed most clearly in the early Christian church by St. Augustine. This is a different St. Augustine. This is the, the North African or African uh, St. Augustine, the Augustine of Hippo. Hippo was a, uh, a very important city in North Africa in, the, uh, in Roman times and Augustine was therefore a Roman citizen, even though he was an African, because remember, much of the northern part of Africa, at any rate, was uh, part of the Roman Empire originally. So, um, Augustine developed this notion of history that if there is a God, and if that God is eternal, and if that God has created everything which exists, then it makes sense that God has been directing history even for people who didn't know that God was directing their history, right? I mean, this wouldn't simply be true of Jews and Christians. This would be true of everybody, including the people of Beowulf. You see, uh, their lives are being directed by God even though they were not Christians and therefore did not know that their lives were being directed by God. Okay, so that conception of history is everywhere in this poem. And sometimes you have some interesting passages where there are tensions between the older view and the newer view. And remember something else that I mentioned earlier on, that Pope Gregory the Great shortly after the conversion of, uh, or the beginnings of the conversion of the peoples of southern England to Christianity, wrote a letter which is quoted by Bede in his famous history to Archbishop Miletus, who was the third Archbishop of Canterbury. And he said, the best way to convert the peoples of the North is to try to adapt Christianity with its beliefs and practices as much as one can to the already existing beliefs and practices of the people there. And that will make it a lot easier for them to accept Christianity. 
You don't want it to seem so foreign to them that they're going to be too resistant. So, uh, one of the things that happened, and this is a famous example that people always cite when they're talking about this, is Halloween. You know, where does Halloween come from? You know, Halloween goes back to an ancient Celtic belief that uh, on that particular night of Halloween, all of these people from the other world come into our world and they demand tribute from us. And if we don't pay them off, in effect, by giving them tribute and honor and so forth, they are going to do some nasty things to us. Sounds like trick or treat, doesn't it? Uh, when all of those outlandish little beings come to your door and demand tribute from you, or uh, you're going to get some nasty trick, at least supposedly. Uh, well, what happened, of course, was that uh, the Christians came along and they simply transformed Halloween into All Hallows Eve. So that the day of October 31st to the day of November 1st was All Souls Day and All Saints Day. And those were two major feast days in Christianity. Okay, and for some Christian denominations, they still are and are still observed in that way. So, uh, that's just one example of how the missionaries and the new Christian culture could absorb and adapt some already existing beliefs and practices to becoming Christian. The stories of St. Christopher, you know, some of you at least have, have heard of St. Christopher, who was always supposed to be the patron saint of, uh, of travelers, and he would usually be seen with a, a small child on his shoulder because there was this story about how St. Christopher uh, carried the Christ child across an otherwise deep and dangerous river. And he was venerated for centuries and centuries and centuries as a Christian saint until, actually it was I think in the 1960s, uh, it was established by scholars that St. Christopher really was a kind of, of Celtic divinity, you know, uh, who predated Christianity by a very long time. So poor St. Christopher got demoted and uh, so he, he no longer is venerated in the same way that he was before. So, uh, but this is an example of the kind of thing that, that uh, scholars of this period talk about. Well, so also in a way with the dream of the rood. Remember when we were talking about the dream of the rood and I said, look what's happened to the narrative of Christ's passion and death. You know, in which Jesus was, was hauled into court. He was uh, tortured horribly, you know, flogged. And I mean, a flogging was a really, really, really nasty business uh, among the Romans. Uh, because there, there were these steel or iron barbs on the end of the leather thongs that would tear your skin. Uh, so you weren't simply being beaten with, with whips, but also these things that would tear your skin. And then the crown of thorns, you know, beaten into his skull, and then dragged off and, and crucified in an even more horrible way than many crucifixions were. Uh, notice how that whole narrative is transformed in the dream of the rood, as we were talking about before, right? Well, once again, notice that the Christian narrative, one of the central Christian narratives, is being adapted to make it more appealing to this new audience in this new context in the North. Okay? So also with Beowulf. Here's a story that goes back way before the beginnings of Christianity in England. And notice that Christian ideas are constantly being incorporated into the poem and references to Christianity are being imported into the poem. And that kind of adaptation is not only making it acceptable 
for people to continue to value this story, because now it can be viewed from a Christian point of view. But also notice that works the other way too. It makes Christianity more culturally, uh, what shall we say, prestigious, acceptable, right? I mean, if you, if you take the argument that epics usually represent the highest ideals of a culture, and then you introduce new elements into the epic, one of the things that could take place is that those new elements would themselves be seen as having the same kind of high value as the epic itself. So, um, so we move on. The plot structure of Beowulf, and by the way, what I'm about to say here is just straight out of Tolkien. Tolkien wrote a very, very famous work, by the way. <clears throat> it's called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. And in his famous work, he talks about the plot construction of Beowulf as a movement from youth to old age. This is another one of the central tensions in the work. Notice that the early part of Beowulf focuses on fights with Grendel and Grendel's mother. Then there is a transitional section in which we have an explanation of how Beowulf becomes the king of the Geats. And then we have the last part of the work when he's an old man. How old is he? Anybody have any idea of how old uh, Beowulf has to be, even roughly, by the end of, uh, of the work? Any thoughts? Well, they say he rules for 50 winners, so he at least has to be that old. He at least has to be reasonably older than 50. Right, 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 right. And so if you allow for the fact that at the beginning of the work, I mean, he's not a child, right? I mean, he's, he's a grown man, and he's also established himself as a hero among his own people. So he's obviously an adult. Uh, so let's even say uh, that he's as young as 20. I mean, he could be older than 20 in the early part. Could be in his 20s somewhere. But let's even say that at the youngest, he might be around 20. Well, OK. Uh, then we have, in that long middle section of the poem, all of those feuds and wars and so forth that go on in which it is explained how Beowulf eventually comes to the kingdom himself. I mean, those took a number of years. And then, as you point out, at the end, we learn that he has ruled over his people for 50 winters. The Scandinavians, by the way, and North Germanic people, naturally enough, counted years by winters. Guess why? To survive a winter is a big deal, you know, when you live up not too far from the Arctic Circle. And uh, so naturally enough, people would be very impressed by, by winters, and so they would count time in terms of the number of winters they had lived through. Um, so we're now talking about somebody who has to be in his middle to later 70s, possibly 80, right? And he's the one who's going to be called upon to protect his people, to lead a war band out to fight against the dragon. And he is the one who still is going to uh, have to perform great heroic deeds. He knows, doesn't he, that he's doomed when he goes out there. So we have an entirely different tone or attitude in the work at the end from what we had at the beginning of the poem, when he's in the fullness of his youth and his physical powers. So we have then a movement from the heroic to the elegiac. Now what that means is that the term heroic 
and the term epic are often used interchangeably. Epics are about heroes, aren't they? Epics are about heroes. What does Homer sing about? He sings about great heroes, doesn't he? Achilles and Hector and so forth in the Iliad and then in the Odyssey, particularly about Odysseus, but there are also other heroic figures as well. So that this is heroic poetry. It's often referred to as heroic poetry. And in the early triumphs of strength, we have Beowulf as hero. But in the concluding part of the work, we have a kind of tragic tone being established through that whole long final section from the point at which Beowulf learns about the dragon flying out over his land and breathing fire onto the villages until Beowulf finally dies in his fight with the dragon. The whole thing establishes a tone of tragedy right? Of doom, of loss, of sadness, and the sadness of the passing away of Beowulf himself. So that even though he is victorious, with the help of his cousin, Wiglaf, by the way, nevertheless, his victory is a tragic victory. So we shift from the tone of the heroic to the elegiac. What does the word elegiac mean? It comes from the word elegy. And an elegy is a poem about someone who has died. It's a poem about someone who has died. That's what an elegy is. It's distinguished, by the way, from the word eulogy, which is a funeral speech. Like at a funeral, when somebody, it could be an officiating person or a relative, gets up and delivers the speech about the person, that's called a eulogy. But the poem is called an elegy, E-L-E-G-Y. Okay. In the movement of the episodes, you'll notice that this is not a straightforward narrative. It's constantly being interrupted by things that people think of as digressions. I mean, parts of the narrative are chronological, like at the beginning. We have Hrothgar coming to uh, the throne in Denmark. And then we have him building Herod, the great hall, the great mead hall. And then we have uh, the coming of Grendel. And Grendel not only savagely attacking and slaughtering many of the Danish warriors, but also Hrothgar having to leave his great hall, at least during the nighttime. He could return during the day if he wanted to, but in the nighttime he has to cede the hall once again to Grendel. And then we have Beowulf coming, having heard about this, and he comes to help Hrothgar, who had, by the way, as we find out, helped Beowulf's father at an earlier time when Beowulf's father was in trouble. So Beowulf, in effect, is paying back Hrothgar for that earlier kindness to his father. And then we go into, you know, the killing of Grendel, and then we have Grendel's mother coming, and then we have uh, Beowulf going and killing Grendel's mother, and then we have the aftermath with Hrothgar sending uh, Beowulf on his way. Beowulf goes on his way, goes back to his own land, and tells his uncle Heolach and Heolach's wife, the queen, his story, turns over his gifts to them, and then we have a break. And that's when we go into that middle section. But along the way, even within the chronology of, the, of a narrative like the one I've just outlined, you will have all kinds of little side narratives, right, embedded in there. You will have the songs of the shop. Shop is, let's see what I did with my pen here. OK. Let's see. Let me. Wipe out Tacitus for the time being. 
the old English word for a poet singer. And poets were singers, by the way. I mean, there was no such thing as poetry experience the way we might experience it. I mean, if you went to a poetry reading nowadays, you might have a poet who would be reading from his or her uh, collection of poems. Poetry was always sung or chanted. And so the, the poet singer was called a, oh, I didn't do this part. Okay, it was called a S-C-O-P. It looks like scop, but it's pronounced shop. S-C in Old English is pronounced like R-S-H. That's a shop. Okay, so we have those songs of the shop, right? Old stories, old mythological tales, all that sort of thing. So, the episodic nature of the plot is such that it consists of episodes and you move from one episode to another episode to another episode to another episode, but these are not all causally connected to one another. It's not exactly as if one episode produces another episode, which in turn produces another episode. You see what I mean? That's what we mean when we talk about an episodic plot. An episodic plot. One which consists of loosely strung together episodes. Now, part of that results from the fact that the poem was improvised in oral performance. If we can go back to the PowerPoint, please. Improvised in oral performance. Remember I mentioned this during our, our last hour, that poets were extemporaneous poets. People would get up and they would simply start in with the sung poetry. And the poem didn't exist independently of their performance. The performance was the poem. And so the whole thing was improvisation in the same way that, uh, say, rap singers in our time can do it, you know, where a good rap singer is improvising it, right? It's not that there's a text which is being performed. It's all improvisation. Jazz music is all improvisation, isn't it? And so that's why you have that, that seeming discontinuousness in the plot. You know, it moves forward, it moves sideways, it moves backwards, and so forth at different times in what seem to be digressions. But it's simply because you have an episodic plot which is being composed spontaneously in performance. So in the very writing of the poem down, when it finally did get written down, we have all of these traces of its original orality so that we create a sense of this being orally performed. Again and again and again, we hear the voice speaking to us or singing to us of the poet or of somebody else, for that matter. And so we have, even in its written form, a sense of what this must have been like when it was orally performed as a poem. How did it get written down? That's a mystery. We don't know. Maybe it was taken down from an actual oral performance. There's at least one eminent scholar who thinks so. But enough for now. <laughs>